Good afternoon everyone, my name is Grant Williams, I'm a Portfolio Manager and Strategy Advisor to Volpez Investment Management here in Singapore and since 2009 the author of a financial newsletter called Things That Make You Go Hmm. It's a great privilege for me to be speaking uh, to you all here today, I've met so many wonderful speakers. Uh, when I was asked to give this presentation I spent some considerable time racking my brains for a suitable subject about which to talk to you as normally I'm only let loose at things like precious metals conferences. So after much consideration and with one eye on something I know you all hold very dear, I decided to go back to basics and concentrate on something which to me underpins every part of the world we live in. That's the laws of mathematics. Specifically, I'm going to take a look at the ongoing attempts to subvert these age-old laws by a multitude of governments and central banks who find themselves confronting irrefutable mathematical boundaries which restrict their ability to conduct the policies they feel are now necessary to maintain the status quo. The word mathematics comes from the Greek, mathema, which means what one learns or what one gets to know. And the study of quantity, structure, space and change dates back as far as written records exist. Throughout the centuries, mathematicians have resolved the truth or falsity of conjectures through mathematical proofs, which are demonstrations that if some fundamental axioms are assumed to be true, then certain mathematical statements are necessarily true also. A proof must demonstrate through a series of logical deductive reasonings that a statement is always true. If this isn't possible, the unproven proposition is known as a conjecture. However, some proofs can be a little bit more disingenuous than others. For example, did you know that it's possible to prove mathematically that 0.999 recurring is actually equal to 1? Sounds kind of contrary, but in actual fact it breaks down like this. Pretty straightforward. Now, if you're old school, like me, and you don't trust those sneaky decimals, we can tackle it the old-fashioned way with ordinal fractions. And here, as you can see, it's a very, very simple proof. Now, this equation actually involves the concept of infinity, so it's largely impossible to solve. But it demonstrates that what may seem illogical and contrary to the rules of mathematics can sometimes take a long time to be declared a conjecture. There are many ways to demonstrate mathematical proof, each of which involves uh, more detailed and far more painstaking work than the last. But each of these different methods leads to the same beautiful conclusion, and that's proof. Not only proof, but the acceptance of truth in what was previously merely conjecture. Sometimes, though, that truth can be stark. A few months ago, in relation to this speaking engagement, I wrote a short article for Professional Investing, which is the UK CFA magazine, entitled The Perils of Investing in a Broken Market. In that uh, article, I took a look at the effect that relentless central bank and government intervention has had on markets and the difficulties that creates in trying to find safe homes for capital in today's world. Following on from that article, I put together a presentation entitled Risk, It's Not Just a Board Game in which I expanded upon the theme of the corruption that this intervention has had on the traditional price signals which have been used right throughout economic history to determine capital allocation. And when I gave that presentation to a group of uh, wealthy investors in America earlier this year, I put up a slide that demonstrated the simple but brutal truth and elicited an audible gasp of horror, and not the usual gasp of horror that I get when I present. The slide in question was this one. If you are a common or garden millionaire, and have $10 million lying around that you want to invest in supposedly risk-free treasuries so you can live off your interest, 2013 looks a little different to 2007. Now, more than just about anything I could convey in a single slide, I think the stark reality exposed by this new zero interest rate world in which we live demonstrates how very, very broken markets are. But this is just the beginning. The mathematical rules that have underpinned the entire economic history of the world have been broken at every turn since 2008 showed the world for what it was, an edifice of debt that had been built far too high under the simple assumption that just because it hadn't toppled, it wouldn't topple. The various justifications for the actions taken in the name of saving the system have been for the most part readily accepted by a press and public all too willing to suspend the mathematical belief system they've grown up with despite the nagging doubts that must lay in every sensible heart and mind. Essentially, the conundrum which needs to be solved is this one. Can it really be possible to just print money out of thin air and use it to pay off all the world's debt without there being any unintended consequences? I happen to think the answer is no. And in order to try and answer that essential question, we're going to begin by taking a little journey back in time. We're going to go all the way back to the year 1900. In 1900, a German mathematician named David Hilbert 
published a list of 23 mathematical problems, all of which were unresolved at the time, and he then challenged mathematicians the world over to prove them. These problems sent the mathematical world into quite a spin. Amongst the 23 problems were the legendary number 3, which is widely regarded as the easiest for a non-specialist to understand, and which coincidentally was the first to be solved by a young student of Hilbert's named Max Dane, who in formulating what became known as the Dane invariant, proved that the answer in general is no. Now, I've got to be honest, it seems to me like young Mr. Dane may have gotten lucky with a 50-50 shot, and he gets an invariant named after him. Go figure. I guess that's why number three is famous as the easiest of Hilbert's, of Hilbert's problems, but number eight proved a little bit more tricky. Now, for those of you uh, who fancy a shot at the title, just jot this question down. Number eight was so tricky that the Riemann hypothesis, as it became known in mathematical circles, because it was actually first proposed by Bernhard Riemann in 1859, remains unproven to this day. After the finest mathematical minds of the last 113 years have devoted countless hours to the search for its solution, the problem remains, in the words of the mathematical community, unsolved. Oh, incidentally, I took the liberty of chancing my arm and submitting both yes and no as possible answers, but so far, no word yet from the committee. I'll keep you posted though. Everywhere we look across the financial landscape today, the havoc being wreaked by government and central bank intervention in markets of all description in their misguided attempt to invalidate half the business cycle is creating epic distortions that whilst currently only apparent to those paying attention, will at some point cause trouble for just about everybody. And so as I survey the smoking ruins of what used to be called free market capitalism, I find myself confronting a set of problems that when examined through the prism of good old-fashioned mathematics, just don't seem to add up. So, with that in mind, and with a respectful tip of the hat to David Hilbert, I'd like to unveil to you today, for the first time, William's problems. These are a set of mathematical problems which I can find no clear solution, and so I humbly submit them to the world in the hope that, through solving them, we can understand not only the world we live in, but perhaps our likely future. So let's begin. Oh, I should say before we do, that just to make sure that Dane kid doesn't get himself another invariant named after him, I've already tried and none of the answers to any of these problems is either yes or no, I'm afraid. Williams problem number one. If the global economy is stalling, Europe is in recession, China is slowing and growth is seemingly impossible to generate anywhere, what on earth are equity markets doing at all time highs? Here's perhaps the most widely recognisable chart in the world, the S&P 500, and as you no doubt already knew, but can plainly see here, we are in uncharted territory, with equities, which supposedly represent the prospects of companies whose fortunes are largely determined by the strength of the global economy, at all-time highs. So far, so good. But that's only one side of the story, and if we add another chart, we can see a very strange phenomenon taking place. The second line is the Continuous Commodities Index, a benchmark of commodity prices that includes all the raw materials you just saw scroll behind me. So it's a pretty good uh, bar a barometer of economic activity. As you can see from the divergence between the building blocks of that economic activity and the value of the stock market, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. And not just the state of Denmark, but a bunch of other places too, including Germany's Czech writer, uh, sorry, Europe's Czech writer-in-chief, Germany. As you can see from this eerily familiar chart of the DAX index, which has just made a new all-time high, things everywhere are going up. But no matter, onwards and upwards we go. Incidentally, for those of you uh, keeping score, the DAX has actually added 14% in the last 17 trading days. That's an annualized rate of increase of 466%, whilst the S&P has climbed a thousand points in the last 1,057 days. All perfectly normal, I assure you. But let's take a, uh, a look at the numbers that should matter a great deal in determining the solution to this particular problem. PMI studies are an excellent benchmark of the economic health of the manufacturing sector, with a reading above 50 signalling expansion and a reading below that signalling contraction. So let's see how the world's manufacturing sector is doing. In a nutshell, it's not great. US manufacturing has essentially stalled. The Eurozone is actually contracting. China, well, that's pretty much stuck. Japan's actually the best of a bad bunch, thanks to some epic stimulus, which has sent the PMI surging to the high price of 51.1. UK, well, that's contracting. Germany, how about Germany? Nope, that's contracting too. And bringing up the rear are our old friends in France. And we'll get back to France a little later on. A look at global GDP growth 
reinforces what the PMIs are telling us, as despite the truly epic stimulus applied around the globe in the wake of 2008, 1.4% is the best the world can manage. Europe, the world's largest consumer bloc, is now in full-blown recession, and the trend is to be kind, concerning. And the USA, whilst currently the shining hope to lead the world into recovery and beyond, is only performing strongly in a relative sense. In short, the world is still getting bigger, but it's doing it more slowly. The Baltic Dry Index, a key measure of global trade, which measures the cost of moving bulk materials, including coal, iron ore and grain, across 23 global shipping routes, shows that space on bulk carriers is hardly trading at any kind of a premium. And yet, the Schiller PE ratio, which measures uh, the S&P 500, divided by the 10-year average of inflation-adjusted earnings, currently stands at 24 times, versus its average over the last 130 years of 16 times. Now granted, that's nowhere near the 43 times it reached at the end of the Nasdaq bubble, but those heady days aside, only once has this ratio briefly been higher than where it is today, and that was the spike of 1929, and we all know what happened next. Now should the index revert to its average level over the last 130 years, which, let's face it, is hardly a wild premise, that would mean a near 30% correction in the S&P. The real bull markets that began in 1921 and 1982 did so from five times and seven times respectively, and that's where real bull markets are supposed to start, not from 24 times earnings. US corporates are managing to squeeze ever more juice out of the same lemons, although a great deal of these corporate profits are the result of globalization, and thus they're earned overseas, and in fact retained overseas. And this has pushed profit margins to all-time highs. It's undoubtedly been one of the reasons for strong equity performance, but the past quarter has marked a clear fork in the road for those same US corporates as earnings season has thrown up a couple of warning signs that if history is any guide, should give even the most ardent equity bull pause for thought. Q1 earnings have once again been pretty decent at the bottom line, with 74% of companies beating the magic EPS number in which so much store is placed. But when we look at the top line, things are a lot less rosy, with almost half of reporting companies missing their forecast sales revenues. Things are even worse in Europe, where only 44% of companies in the stock 600 managed to win at this game of beat the number, uh, and a whopping 66% missed their sales revenues. Revenue for the S&P 500, well, that fell 0.3% year on year amidst a clearly declining trend, whilst the rate of EPS growth has slowed from uh, significant levels after the bounce from 2008 to a near standstill. Now, these are really difficult numbers to reconcile with daily new all-time highs for the index. So with that weakening equity performance as backdrop, let's go back to the S&P and look at an even more worrying disconnect. The Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg US Macro Surprise Index measures whether macro data is beating or missing economists' forecasts. As you can see, the last three months have seen a precipitous deterioration in the published data versus the rather optimistic forecasts of the economic profession. But that hasn't stopped the equity market from making new all-time highs on virtually a daily basis. There's been all sorts of talk of yield-starved investors piling into equities. This is the so-called great rotation that people like to talk about and also about a soon-to-be resurgent U.S. economy, as well as the fact that, historic, uh, so that equities aren't cheap, uh, aren't expensive historically. Unfortunately, that phrase is not a euphemism for cheap, which is the right time to buy them. But we find ourselves living in a QE world, and despite what anybody tells you, there really is one major factor in the soaring equity markets, and it's very much an outside agency. It's tough to make a case for the high-flying S&P that isn't either relative i.e. equities offer a better yield than bonds, or hopeful. All the signs point to a strong economic recovery, insert forward-looking time frame here. But if we take a look outside the traditional forces commonly affecting equity markets, we find a possible reason for the disconnect in Williams' problem number one. Since early 2009, the Federal Reserve has increased its balance sheet by about $1.3 trillion through its various bond purchase programs. Now, I should add for clarity at this point that the Fed is absolutely not buying equities, categorically not doing so, because what central bank will do anything like that? Yeah. Well, look, what do you expect them to do? I mean, they can't just put trillions of dollars in government bonds that don't yield anything. I mean, these guys need some income, for God's sake. Anyway, as you can see from this chart, the correlation between the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet and the S&P 500 since 2009 stands at around 88%. But 
What's also noticeable is the path the equity market took during the periods when the Fed attempted to take a little steam out of things. As you can see from these red uh, shaded areas, each time the Fed's balance sheet went sideways or, God forbid, slightly lower, the equity market fell precipitously. What's even more obvious is the correlation when Ben Bernanke and crew have their foot hard on the gas. And so despite a wealth of fundamentals that scream caution, equity markets continue to make new highs seemingly every day. And the biggest catalyst for that seems not to be improving economic fundamentals, far from it, but rather the corruption of the risk-free rate through massive central bank intervention, which makes traditional value investing virtually impossible. What the central bankers of the world have in effect given us is a choice. You either sit on the sidelines in cash and watch your money be eaten slowly but inevitably away by the twin terrors of inflation and negative real interest rates, or you hold your nose and you buy stuff just because it's going up and you forget everything you learned when you took your CFA exam, for example. It's some choice. So, in a nutshell, that is William's problem number one, the disconnect between fundamentals and equity prices. William's problem number two, if Chinese manufacturing has stalled, demand for raw materials is slumping, imports and exports are declining and Chinese power consumption is falling, how on earth is China's GDP growing at 7.7%? Now China's perhaps the second most polarizing investment of them all, and we'll get to number one a little bit later on. And this is largely because of two important factors. Firstly, the stakes are just so incredibly high in terms of what China either rising or falling has come to mean for the rest of the world. And secondly, the data that comes out of China is, how can I put this delicately, questionable. Of course, after its rapid expansion through the 1990s in the last decade, the world has become used to double-digit growth from China, and China has gotten used to not disappointing anybody, no matter what's been going on under the hood. And so, Chinese GDP growth has become a very closely watched number for all those looking to understand whether this huge country is on the up or not. But Chinese GDP is something of a curate's egg. Let me explain. The National Bureau of Statistics compiles Chinese GDP in two weeks, and the number is published 18 days after the end of the quarter. It's never revised. Contrast that to the United States, a country with around 22% of the population of China, and that takes eight weeks to compile its data, which is then revised several times. What's even more strange is the fact that Hong Kong, which has a population of just 7 million compared to China's 1.4 billion, takes six weeks to collect its data curious. Now there are 31 provinces that make up China as the West knows it, and it's these 31 provinces that contribute the raw data that together constitutes Chinese GDP. The delegation of reporting numbers to the individual provinces and then aggregating them centrally is fraught for potential for fun and games, particularly as each of those provinces is under tremendous pressure to hit their targets. How does this manifest itself? Well, nothing hides it more effect, uh, highlights it more effectively than the most recent set of statistics, which is uh, first quarter GDP numbers for 2013, which were released a few weeks ago. The blue bars on this chart show the individual province growth reported, and the red bar at the right end shows the aggregated number reported to the rest of the world. In the interest of uh, space, I've left out the names of the provinces, but for reference, the two immediately to the left of the red bar on the end there are Shanghai and Beijing. Now, amazingly enough, each and every one of the provinces reported growth that exceeded the national number. Mathemat uh, mathematicians amongst you are already scratching your head. Go figure. This is nothing new though, and it dates back to a discrepancy between two government agencies who between them tally the data, but the disparity between these two numbers is growing steadily and rapidly. The gap now measures, incredibly, about $450 billion, or 11% of China's GDP. Anyway, accounting shenanigans aside, Here's what the chart of Chinese GDP looks like, and as you can see, it's rolled over and has, in fact, been trending lower for some time now. We've already seen how the numbers could be deemed a little suspect, but let's take a look at Chinese economic activity and see if that helps us to solve problem number two. We've seen Chinese PMI already in an earlier slide, but here's a closer look at it, and as you can see, the Chinese manufacturing sector is hardly going great guns. To all intents and purposes, manufacturing has stalled in China. The price of iron ore imports into the country has also dropped, and that too is trending lower, suggesting that raw material imports are continuing to decline. Talking of raw material imports, this chart should definitely set alarm bells ringing to anybody paying attention. Total 
Chinese copper product imports have almost halved since 2009. Which brings us to an old favourite chart, the growth in China's power consumption, which after three years of steady decline is now barely growing at all. Putting all this together and throwing into the mix the fact that China's imports and exports are both continuing their steady decline, it's increasingly difficult to reconcile the fact that China's economy is still supposedly powering ahead at a 7.7% clip. So that's William's problem at number two, the disparity between Chinese headline growth and Chinese economic activity. William's problem number three, France. Europe has long been split into the core and the periphery, as I'm sure you all know, with the strong northern economies of Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, Austria and Finland, here in blue, helping support the weaker southern countries such as Portugal, Cyprus and Greece. Also included in the core originally were Italy and France, based upon the sheer size of their economies. But as the debt crisis has slowly crept across Europe over the last several years, it's claimed Italy moving it from the core towards the periphery, and should France begin to go the same way, it really is game over for Europe. Gradually, Europe's core has rotted away, as a union that was flawed in its construction from day one has had to face up to the harsh reality that a monetary union without a fiscal union just won't work in times of stress. And thanks to its size and its more robust health at the time of the EU's creation, France is well and truly on the hook, as you can see from this chart, which shows each country's contribution to the 2012 EU budget. Unfortunately for France, the UK, as demonstrated by the rise of Nigel Farage's UKIP party, likely wants out of the EU, and they're the third biggest contributor. Italy, well, they can't really afford it, let's be honest. This lot, eh, you know, what are they going to do realistically? And that just leaves Germany, and they're screwed. Here we have the nine biggest contributors to the ESM, the European, uh, European Stability Mechanism, a 700 billion euro bailout facility which was put in place back in 2012 in order to stop Europe's debt crisis from destroying the grand project that is the EU. Here in blue are our friends in France, the second largest contributor to the ESM with paid in capital of 16.3 billion euros against a total commitment of 142 billion. Now like all things in Europe, these commitments have been calculated on what's fair. And so each country pays in according to its size. And of course, France has always been the second biggest kid on the block in terms of the size of its economy. However, the fundamentals of that economy are beginning to catch up with this socialist paradise at the heart of the European dream. And once again, a realistic look at those saddled with the responsibility to save Europe demonstrates the problem of living beyond your means. First, we can get rid of these three basket cases who are, in terms of this particular IOU, bankrupt and of no use to anybody. Italy, well that has problems enough of its own, and they could hardly be relied upon to cough up the 125 billion euros they promised should push come to shove. And of course, that leaves the good old Germans. And they're screwed. Now, if you search Wikipedia for the term French philosophers, you are presented with a list of some 800 names. Men and women famed the world over for their insight and clarity of thinking. Bastiat, Camus, Descartes and Voltaire are all names that conjure up images of earnest men deep in thought in a series of dark, smoky rooms who occasionally leap up and proclaim statements of great profundity. Bastiat, in particular, was no lover of either the government or of the state. If, however, we do a similar search for the term French economists, we end up with a slightly different result. Now, there's a very, very good reason for that. Last year, the French, in their infinite wisdom, decided that the very best man to lead them through the financial and social turmoil enveloping the country was this gentleman, Francois Hollande, a card-carrying socialist who proclaimed that his enemy was the world of finance. Ignoring the echoes of Bastiat's warnings from centuries earlier, Hollande did what socialist rulers do best once he assumed power. His very first action upon taking office was to lower the retirement age in France, amidst, I might add, continent-wide austerity drives from all the other members of the EU, citing, of course, social justice. Now, naturally, the additional cost will be funded largely through additional contributions from, well, you can probably guess, but this was his next move. Hollande set about increasing taxation on, naturally, the rich, with, amongst other things, a 75% top-rate millionaire's tax. That had predictable results. 
Requests by French citizens to leave the country rose 500%. And the charge was led, humorously enough, by France's richest man, who moved across the border to Belgium. And, of course, famously, Gérard Depardieu, who, with delicious irony, decided that in order to escape uh, Holland's brand of socialism, he'd rather be a Russian. Now, it says uh, two movie stars on the slide. Bridget Bardot was the other one, but in fairness, her move to Russia had a lot more to do with two dead elephants, apparently. It was a whole other story. Mm -hmm. Either way, you just cannot make this stuff up. But enough anecdotal evidence of France's problems. Let's look at the country's economy. And to do that, there really is nowhere better to start than the public sector. France's bloated public sector is famous throughout the world, and it currently accounts for a staggering 56% of government expenditure something Monsieur Hollande is going to struggle mightily to change without making some very hard and undoubtedly extremely unpopular decisions, which will involve major restructuring, not only of the runaway government spending, but also the tax system and state pensions. 35% of the working population in France are employed by the French government, and that's a number which is only superseded by China, where one in two people work for the, for the government. And the unions in France, despite a comparatively low membership versus countries such as Denmark or Sweden, wield considerable power. Plus, of course, your Commodore Garden Frenchman is very, very happy to take to the streets and pick up a placard at the drop of a hat, unionised or not, which I have to say is another big problem, considering French unemployment, which now stands at 10.7%, which is the highest it's been in 15 years. Now, whilst this is nowhere near as disastrous as the situation in both Greece and Spain, where more than one in two of under 25s are out of work, 26.5% of French youths are currently unable to find a job. That's a problem that will be exacerbated once the arrival of the Northern Hemisphere summer uh, is here. Over the last 50 years, France's level of public spending has ebbed and flowed, but invariably it expands either more or less quickly each quarter. As you can see, during the roughly 200 quarters uh, shown on this graph, there have only been a handful when that spending has actually contracted. France has the second, uh, second highest level of public spending in the OECD, behind Denmark, and it leads the way in spending on social programs as a percentage of GDP. A recent OECD forecast uh, said that the 2 trillion euro French economy would grow only 0.1% in 2013 after coming in at precisely zero in 2012. Now the year hasn't exactly got off to a great start for Hollande, with the first quarter GDP number forecast to be positive to the tune of 0.1% coming in at minus 0.2% last week, which pushed France back into recession. Of course, Hollande's government are now revising their somewhat hopeful budget estimates because this puts them on course to miss that forecast, which was 0.8% growth. And their response to the OECD, I have to say, was masterful, with Hollande committing to budgetary responsibility over the medium term, whatever that means. And he then explained how to solve the crisis. Forget liberté, égalité and fraternity, now it's the turn of credibility, sustainability and stability. That medium term, though, could well provide along with a few problems, as you can see from France's debt maturity profile. In the short term, he has to get through three big years of debt repayments up to 2015. But assuming the medium term is 2016 to 2019, one can only presume that Hollande is going to need to address another little problem that, amazingly enough, has kind of crept up on it. Yes, it's France's budget deficit, which currently stands at 4.8%. That's almost 2% outside the EU mandated limit of 3% and against a self-imposed target of 4.5% for 2012. Of course, this miss has the French government back to the drawing board once again and their pledge to meet this 3% EU mandated target by the end of 2013 has completely fallen by the wayside. Their new target is now 3.7%, so place your bets on whether they get anywhere near that, but they've asked for an extension out to 2015 now in order to square things away. The chances, one would have to say, are slim at best. The last time France ran a balanced budget was 1974, and this past year, Hollande's first in power saw public debt rise to 1.8 trillion euros. That's 90.2% of GDP, and it represents almost a 5% increase in a single year. Of course, there were mitigating, or rather, exceptional circumstances as to why France missed these targets, and Hollande's finance minister, Pierre Moscovici, was kind enough to lay them out for us. Moscovici was at pains to point out that had Dexia not needed rescuing and recapitalising, and had France not been forced to pay additional contributions to the EU as a penalty of overshooting their budget deficit, 
that deficit, instead of being minus 4.8%, would only have been minus 4.7%, which, of course, means that they'd still have been forced to pay those additional contributions. But, sadly, this is what counts for good news in France these days, I'm afraid. That's government finances in France, but how about the economy? Well, as you can see here, industrial production is negative, and after some signal interference due to the events of 2008, it seems to have resumed a trend it began back in 1998. Those GDP numbers we saw earlier, tipping France back into the dreaded double-dip recession, can be seen here in another declining trend also, dating back to 1998. Total household consumption has turned negative, uh, and again, this continues what is an undeniable trend lower. Car registrations in France, uh, this is a great stat, they're declining in France and have been for 10 years now. It's gentle, but it's consistent. But it's part of a wider European problem, as you can see here. Between them, Renault and Peugeot employ around 350,000 people, and both those companies need to cut thousands of staff. But plans by Peugeot announced in January to do just that have taken four months to receive both government and union backing after several legal challenges. In the meantime, the company has been bleeding around 200 million euro a month in losses. So what does all this add up to? Well, once a solid member of Europe's core, France's economy would suggest that its rightful place is moving ever closer to the periphery. After all, as I keep being told, size really isn't everything. Numbers notwithstanding, even the French, once the staunchest of Europhiles, are beginning to rethink their love affair with being a big part of the EU. As you can see here, the number of people in France who think that economic conditions are good is far, far closer to that of Spain, Italy and Greece than fellow core member Germany. Rising prices, too, are a much bigger problem in France than one would ordinarily assume in a strong uh, core economy. And the lack of employment opportunities looks eerily, eerily reminiscent of a far more Mediterranean viewpoint. It's getting harder and harder to make the case for France to be considered a core country at all, for any other reason than its sheer size. In fact, far from being a core country, France has all the makings of what I'm going to call a fig. And yet, despite all this, the French government is somehow blessed with the ability to borrow money for 10 years at less than 2%, which is once again more of a reflection on its size as well as investors' ingrained belief that France is just too big to get into any kind of trouble than any kind of sensible uh, assessment of its economic prospects. France remains, for the time being at least, a safe haven. In fact, amazingly enough, the Hollande government is, in the eyes of the investing world, the most creditworthy government in 400 years of French history. Now this chart only goes back 250 years, but I couldn't find the other one. Trust me, 400 years is the right number. Hollande's government is able to borrow money cheaper than any other government in the history of the French Republic. How long for them? That is the $64,000 mathematical problem. And William's problem number three. The absurdity of France. Now, there's one more problem I want to get to and we are running out of time, so I'm going to skip some of the less pressing ones here. Uh, I don't think we need to do that one. Uh, no, that one can wait for another day. We really don't have time for that one. Uh, here we are, let's do this one. Number seven. William's problem number seven. The gold price and the price of gold are mutually exclusive. Gold is a very popular topic of conversation. Uh, it's one that I talk about all the time, and it always elicits all kinds of lively debate. And those debates can get quite heated at times because gold, uh, amongst many other things, is a very emotional asset. It has no cash flow, there's no net asset value. In fact, it has no way of valuing it in a traditional way uh, at all. And thus, it's always simply been a mirror. It's a reflection of the perceived valuation of other more risky investments. But gold has been money good for thousands of years. And despite what several misguided Wall Street analysts might think, I believe the gold market is a long, long way from being over. That's only going to happen once the conditions surrounding it have normalised, whatever that's going to mean in the future. And the debt mountain causing these outside interferences, which are distorting markets, has been dealt with through either inflation or default. I think we've seen so far that the third option, growth, is pretty much off the table for the time being. Either way, inflation or default will be positive for gold, but recently gold has been under some serious and, mathematically speaking at least, inexplicable pressure. Before we get to that recent action in the gold market, let's get a better understanding of the difference between the gold price and the price of gold. 
the gold price is essentially the price of a piece of paper conveying upon the buyer of that piece of paper the right to take delivery from the seller of the stipulated amount of gold in the contract, in this case 100 troy ounces in good delivery form. All the gold that's physically settled as a result of a futures transaction must conform to good delivery standards in terms of purity and it must bear an approved hallmark. The price of gold, on the other hand, is something altogether different. The price of gold is whatever the hell you have to pay to actually get your hands on an ounce of physical metal, and it's very, very different. It differs from day to day, it differs from city to city, and within those cities it differs from dealer to dealer, but it's nearly always higher than the gold price. Traditionally, physical gold trades at a premium to the futures price, and that premium fluctuates depending on the level of demand for physical metal. The subtle difference between the two has always been uppermost in the minds of people who are laughingly called gold bugs, but Developments in the gold market over the last nine years, primarily since the listing of the GLD ETF in 2004, have meant that more and more money has been casually diverted into paper gold. The ease of doing this, no storage, no transportation, no insurance cost, has meant money that finds its way easily into gold has a similarly trouble return, a trouble-free return journey. And this has been one of the main causes of the increased volatility in gold over that period. By way of an example, this table is a snapshot of premiums for gold and silver coins and small bars on eBay uh, as of uh, September 27, 2012, when the gold price was $1,777 an ounce. Now if we strip out the silver products, we can see that the average premium on the remaining gold items was 9.49%, which means that despite the gold price being $1,777 an ounce, the price of gold was in fact $1,945, and in the case of one uh, tenth of an ounce gold eagles, the price of gold was $2,041. So, let's take a look at the gold price, and in particular the events of April uh, this year, which, as I mentioned earlier, challenged every law of mathematical probability that's ever been written. As you can see, the gold price has had a fairly orderly move, from 275 bucks in early 2000 to 1900 in September of 2011, if anything that goes up 600% can do so in an orderly fashion. If we take out the volatility of 2008, it's uh, pretty much been plain sailing for the gold price. But then came this blow-off top in August of 2011, when the European debt crisis was uh, at its peak, certainly to date. The downgrade of the USA and a threat of default over the debt ceiling were all simultaneously hanging over the market. At that point in time, the gold price surged to 1900 bucks, and it looked for all the world as if it was going to go up forever. But, of course, that never happens, and so it began a correction. That correction has now been going on for 18 months. Oh, by the way, the uh, gold price is the perfect illustration of the difference between a correction and a collapse. With the gold price currently at 1364 bucks, if your entry price was here, then the move from 1900 has been a correction. But if you bought gold here, it's been a collapse. It really is that simple, and perspective is a wonderful thing. But I digress. Let's get back to the gold price. Recently, the gold price broke down out of its corrective pattern, as you can see here. But the nature of that breakdown is where we find some really, really strange goings on. Now, this chart may look a little strange to some of you, but bear with me. It tells a very, very important story. In the top half of the chart, you can see red bars, which are down moves, and green bars, which represent up moves. Each bar represents a five-minute period. And this set of bars shows trades on the COMEX June Gold Futures contract on April the 12th, 2013 between 6.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. The bars in the bottom half of the chart show volume traded in those particular five minute intervals. Now there was no headline news out on the day that would ordinarily specifically affect the gold price either positively or negatively. Now in the preceding week there had been three high profile sell calls on gold, one from Credit Suisse, one from Sockgem uh, Sock and an extraordinary uh, short gold call from Goldman Sachs. We also had the um, erroneous early distribution of the Fed Minutes, which discussed the fantasy of tapering earlier in the week. And some stories have been floating around that uh, Cyprus may be forced to sell some of its gold, though the amount that they were mooting was a, a fraction of a day's volume on the LBMA, so it really wasn't a relevant number. Now, the first highlighted period here saw gold fall $15 in 15 minutes on volume of about 34,000 contracts, or 3.4 million ounces of gold. That's 100 tons in old money. But the second period saw another 100,000 contracts, or 10 million ounces of gold, sold in a 40-minute period. That's another 300 tons. In all, 400 tons of gold were sold in paper form into the market. That's an amount representing 
fully 15% of total global annual production and it equates to a staggering $20 billion worth of gold, although the notional margin which would have to be posted is a paltry, or used to be paltry, $1 billion. The gold price fell over 5% in a single day, the largest fall in 40 years, and it was a 4.88 standard deviation move. To put that into perspective, such an event happens, mathematically speaking, every 4,776 years, but the fun was just getting started. On the following Monday, after Clark spent the weekend sending out margin calls to the leverage longs in the gold market, the gold price took another far heavier beating, as you can see from the chart here. This time uh, the chart shows the daily moves instead of the five minute intervals, with the red bars again being down days and the green bars being up days. That second big red bar in the center there shows the move on the Monday after the Friday. That Monday move, high to low, took in a $150 range. Over the two days, gold fell $213, and this is where the maths gets even more astounding. The two-day move in the gold price was an eight standard deviation event. Now, if you want a frequency estimate on that, it gets a little tricky. What I can tell you is that a seven standard deviation event happens less than once every one billion years. What I can also do for you is give you an image to help with understanding the mathematical improbability of the two-day move in the gold price. This is the US debt ceiling in $100 bills, $16.394 trillion um, with the Statue of Liberty in the middle there to scale. Now, if we converted each of these $100 bills into 100 singles, and we stacked them up, thus making each of these piles 100 times higher than they are in this picture, and I took a single dollar bill, like this one, I colored the four ones in the corners red, like this, and I then slipped that dollar bill somewhere into this pile of singles. An eight standard deviation event will be any one of you in this room casually walking up to this pile of money and randomly pulling out that one dollar bill that I just put in there with the red ones on it at your first attempt. These are very, very strange days we're living through. So that's the gold price action. Now we're going to look at the price of gold in the aftermath of what was, by anybody's estimation, a crash of some form or another. How did the public react to the crash in the gold price? Did they rush to sell the asset that had crashed like they did in 1987 or 2000 or 2008 with equities? Uh, are these people standing in line waiting to get rid of their gold? No. In fact, they did the exact opposite and they stampeded to the nearest gold dealer in order to buy physical metal at a 20% discount. But of course, the price of gold was definitely not the same as the gold price. Premiums were being quoted as much as 25% above the spot price that had garnered all the attention, which of course completely negated the entire downward move on the futures market. But that didn't matter because the headlines were all about the supposed crash in the gold price. Gold demand over this period in India jumped 138% in April to $7.5 billion and premiums there increased fivefold. While Dubai saw demand for bullion running at 10 times the normal volume with 50 tonnes being bought in April alone against a total for 2012 of 51.8 tonnes. Even Australia's Perth Mint saw sales double. But it wasn't just the places you'd expect. It wasn't Macau and Hong Kong and Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, even though they saw tremendous demand, it was Toronto, it was Zurich, it was Sydney, it was London, it was New York, it was Western cities. The list of these cities, both East and West, which saw buyers stampeding to buy physical gold was absolutely extraordinary. And it's this disconnect between paper and physical gold that's at the heart of problem number seven. All that's happened in the wake of the huge downward move in gold has been a massive acceleration of buying of physical metal, as can be seen uh, in this chart of gold imports into China through Hong Kong. 2012 was a bumper year, but China has really quickened the pace of its gold imports through Hong Kong enormously this year. And this is without the April numbers, which will be staggering. Looked at another way, the numbers become even more interesting. April's figures will make, as I said, for absolutely fascinating reading when they're released. But as of March, China had imported 1,206 tonnes through Hong Kong alone in a 15-month period, which, if you put that into context against the total reported official holdings of the People's Bank of China, which is 1,054 tonnes, I think it speaks volumes for whether physical demand for gold is really declining or not. But it's not just the public taking advantage of the weakness in the gold price. 2012 saw central bank gold buying hit levels that hasn't been seen in 50 years, with over 500 tonnes being added to central bank holdings. South Korea, Kazakhstan, Sri Lanka, Mexico, Thailand, Turkey and Russia, to name but a few, all added significantly to their gold holdings in 2012. 
the World Gold Council projects further demand from central banks in 2013 to the tune of another 450 tonnes. Now, I think that's going to turn out to be low, but it adds to the clamour for physical metal. And once central banks start squirrelling gold away, unlike the buyers of the ETF, it tends to stay there for a very, very long time. Now, I'm going to leave you with one last look at the demand for gold, and this time it's the potential demand that I'm going to focus on. This chart shows official gold holdings for numerous central banks around the world, with the dotted line separating the emerging economies from the developed economies, or to put it another way, the buyers from the holders. Western central banks are no longer sellers after 20 straight years of continuous sales uh, under the Washington Agreement, which took the price down to around $250. Uh, all hail the wisdom of the great Gordon Brown. Western central banks hold, on average, 58% of their reserves in gold bullion. Whilst those in the East, the buyers currently, hold a paltry 2.6% on average. Now, here's what would happen should the countries in the bottom half of this chart, who are all buyers of gold, decide that they wish to raise their gold bullion holdings from 2.6% to a hardly extravagant 15%. It would create demand for 17,359 tonnes. That's about seven years of uh, global production and as we can rule out any ounces of gold being uh, sold into the market by either China or Russia you're probably looking more like 15 to 20 years of global gold production. The gold price it's less important than you might be led to believe but the price of gold now that's something that is going to matter a great deal going forward. So what have we learned from looking at Williams problems? Well, first of all, we have established beyond any shadow of a doubt that my primary school headmaster was 100% correct. I definitely have problems. But more usefully for everybody here, I think, there are a few lessons that are worth bearing in mind when we look at the financial landscape. The laws of mathematics cannot be subverted by governments or central banks, certainly not over the long term. If something doesn't add up, the chances are that given time, these nat natural laws of mathematics will restore the order of things once again. Bill Buckler wrote once that after food and shelter, time is the most important economic good, and I cannot echo that sentiment loudly enough. Being able to invest with a longer time horizon and having the patience and the latitude to be wrong in the short term and not get shaken out of sensible long-term investments is probably the biggest single advantage that any investor can have right now. Don't be fooled into believing that the actions of central banks have saved the system. They're doing unprecedented damage with their zero interest rate policy both in the short term through the confiscation of savings and the forcing of investors into risky assets such, such as junk bonds and the search for yield, and perhaps more importantly over the long term by attempting to suppress natural volatility. Beware suppressed volatility. If something makes no sense to you, the chances are that it's nonsense and should be treated as such, or perhaps you'll find the answer either in a book or on Wikipedia. The gold price is absolutely and categorically not the price of gold, and the latter is far, far more important than the former. And Germany is screwed. I'd like to thank you all very, very much for listening. Uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you today, and uh, if there's any questions, I would be delighted to take a stab at answering them. Thanks very much indeed.